Hey everybody, how are you? It is a very exciting day today because I am talking to an expert in something I know nothing about. So those of you who are interested in learning a little something about sake, now is your chance. Uh, I know very little about this topic. In fact, uh, in wine school, I, re I remember uh, there being a week in sake and I remember like this much of it, but I mean, truly we're bringing it back to basics today and we've got an expert to help us do that. We've got Eduardo Dingler, the sake drinker, uh, also a member of the Wine Access Wine Team, a wonderful human being uh, and just a super great guy. So I'm really excited to just see his face and talk all things sake. We're gonna bring him in and let him show us the ropes. Let's do it. How's everything? <laughs> it's good. It is not as good as that hair, though. Oh, my God. It's getting there. I, I, I am love definitely it. working through this. Maybe quarantine lasts another six months. It'll be pretty Jimi Hendrix-like. I don't know. We'll see. It's so good. <laughs> I really love it. It was like, it was a lot shorter last time I saw you live with Jonah. Like, what was that? Two weeks ago. Yeah, wow. totally. It was Just a little more so tame back then. All that, all that rain made it go? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> the rain and, and good sake and good company, even if it's virtual. <laughs> oh, good. First of um, all, so cheers to you. Cheers. I have nothing in my glass yet, but let's change that. Which one are we doing first? Oh, yes. I love to start with the King of Modern Light. So, okay. cool. And we'll talk um, about details and why and all that. I'm not really even sure if this is the the proper glass, but I just I just went for it. Um, so I went with wine glass. You know, let's knock out the glassware right out of the bat. I yeah. love a wine glass because it really brings out the aromatics of, of sake, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it's like a, a premium style, which is what we normally see out there in the market. Um, the little ochocos, which are called the little uh, ceramic cups, are uh -huh. beautiful, very romantic and traditional, especially in a, in a rice setting. Mm -hmm. But they don't often hide away some of the, the beautiful aromatics and complexity that you can get. I mean, uh, Schwitzel and Riedel and all these companies have spent a lot of time and money and effort to get the right glassware. So mm. this is, uh, I mean, I love out of a, any Bordeaux glass, AP glass, you got it right. Great, and do you, do you smell it and taste it the same way you would a wine? Totally, there's certain aromatics in which we'll get to, brought to you by the yeast or by the rice strain mm -hmm. or by the methods or regionality that really accentuate in the glass. So for instance, I don't know if you smell it there, but you should from, from far, Kind of this, this sake has this beautiful kind of white flower chamomile aromatics. Totally. A little fresh cut citrus peel that jumps out of the glass. I don't even have to get it near my, near my face. It's just bam. Yeah. And when we get to the, the takechio, it's even worse. It's like in steroids. So yeah, you smell it, just swirl it a little bit, get the aromatics a little more volatile, give it a quick smell and uh, a sip. And it's just like wine. It's, it it's smells, a beautiful experience. It smells very like tropical and I get more of uh, like papaya and like kind of a uh -huh. salinity. Um, I think you almost, nailed it there with salinity, the mineral component, tension, uh, a little bit of electricity in there. That's yeah. really mouth watering. Uh, I love it. It almost, in a way, I, I'm going to go as far as saying like a little Loire Valley kind of a mm. Sauvignon Blanc or a little bit totally. of a Shannon component. Mm. Oh my gosh, it's so tasty. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. I, I have had like so few sakes and I know so little about it. And already I am like, it's like discovering wine, like wine for the first time and smell like if you love aromatic whites, if like Viognier or Bojala or Vermentino is kind of like in your wheelhouse, this is so yummy. Um, okay. So I don't really know the appropriate place to start. I mean, we started with glassware. Oh, wine glass is very appropriate for a sake uh -huh. of this quality and by the way these are all available on wine access and i think they're both 35 dollars um i think super reasonable um so just to go super back to basics uh sake we, we are treating like a wine um and though it's not made like wine it is made from rice it is and it's actually the process of of, of making uh sake is more like beer it's actually okay. Uh, and, and there's a multiple parallel fermentation that's going on in the production. If we want to get really geeky, we'll get in there and get head, heads exploding. But basically the rice, and I'll go through it briefly through the, through the methodology. I don't want to bore anybody, but please ask questions if, if appropriate. Um, so you start with the rice, right? You get the rice like you get it at the store, brown rice. Then it's milled. And by taking away the outer layers of the grain of rice, you start designating the quality level. And quality, not meaning the more is the best. It's all defined in style. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But basically, you get the rice, you start milling away the, the grain, and uh, rice grains are very important. And there's certain ones that are like the godfathers or, or grandparents of, of uh, like grapes. There's like Cabernet Sauvignon. Bread. Okay. Exactly. There's like Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, there's uh, Merlot, there's certain parentage, right? But mm -hmm. from there, uh, there's hundreds of strains of rice that are used in sake, just like I like to see it like Italy has all these heirloom varietals popping mm -hmm. up, like Erba Luce and Gavi and all these things. Like we find one every year, basically. Mm -hmm. Rice is similar. And then there's also the hybrids and all these things. So in this one in particular, this is a, a Kita Sake Komachi rice, which is a, a rice that is seldom used um, throughout the mainstream sake producers. But uh, it, it gives this sharp tension acid, beautiful style. So the, the rice strain will bring you some of the flavor, the texture into the final product. So you go milling the, outside, the outer layers of the grain of rice and you go, and we'll go briefly, we can go in detail. You can go, I see it like a triangle, I'm very visual. So you have uh, in the bottom, you have Junmai or Honjozo, which is a lower style, the, the one you just take a little bit off, retain a little more flavor and texture, mm -hmm. richer. And then there's the Ginjo or, or Junmai Ginjo, which is a little more crisp, more versatile, kind of like a great, middle of the road kind of uh, fun start, uh, which this one is. And then you have on the top, top little triangle, uh, Daiginjo or Junmai Daiginjo, which re refers to 50% or more milling on the grain of rice. So you get very low yields, very elegant. You get just to the core of the rice grain and it, mm -hmm. it creates a very elegant, feminine, soft style in which um, it's fantastic. Uh, often, if not 99% of the time, it's the most expensive style and it's a very Japanese fashion I love that about the culture. If there's no labor or material involved, you don't pay more. So basically to go backwards, if you have a, a Junmai Daiginjo or Daiginjo, it's going to be more expensive, but that's clearly because the, the material used, the rice you started with is way less. Sometimes, I mean, you go as far as milling uh, to 5%. So it's ridiculous the 1% in some cases of the grain of rice. And also the labor, the, the time that goes into making the, the grain of rice, it could take up to three, four days just to, group, to mill that, the batch into that, that small percentage. So Crazy. beyond the rice, you have the water. And this is, I like to see a more of a beer brewery or a distillery where this is your regional imprint. So you're in, either in Scotland making whiskey or you're in San Diego making craft brewing. The water you have defines by minerality and, and a lot of the attributes, the style you're gonna produce. So you create that richer or softer style. So uh, there's certain places, like today we're covering Niigata. Niigata is like one of the places with the highest production, highest number of brewers, uh, 90 of them nearly. So there's a reason, there's this mountain range called the Echigo Mountains, and it's fantastic. It's like the Japanese Alps kind of cuts through uh, the middle of Japan, like a spine. And all that creates a lot of snow melt, soft water. So all this soft water gives a silky quality to it in, in terms of like what you have on the final product and what you're tasting. Yeah. And then the, the, third, pro, the third part of the, the production, it's yeast. So yeast is incredible. Yeast, as we know, it's, it's necessary to produce pretty much every alcoholic beverage. And yeast is this your friend that's gonna eat all the sugars and create the alcohol. But in the case of sake, it's so important because it really brings out, by doing the process, a lot of the aromatics. So in this one, you're smelling a lot of citrus and tropical, as you mentioned, and all these qualities. They're mostly brought because of the yeast strain that's used. There's a few yeast strains that you can see more often, number seven, number nine, number six, that um, you can buy them at the, at the bank in Japan. There's a bank for the yeast. <laughs> and also there's natural occurring, uh, just like at wine. You can have like ambient yeast living there and it, it creates another bigger footprint or stamp signature mm -hmm. of your brewery. Uh, but that's basically the function, creating the alcohol and bringing us out a lot of aromas. The uh, fourth ingredient is koji. And koji is, it's hard to wrap around at first, but it's basically a mold and is used in Japan, throughout everything, through uh, to making shochu, which is a Japanese spirit, mm -hmm. fantastic, mostly from the south, uh, making soy sauce, miso, all these things that we're familiar with. I mean, yeah. But what it does in sake, and again, I don't want to bore anybody, but let's pretend no, this Koji is, is a person. This is so 
So let's pretend Koji is a person. And Koji is that guy or girl that you knew in college and would call you on a Monday or a Friday to go party and say, I don't care if you have an exam coming up or finals, we're going to go party, we're going to hit the bars or going to do a house party with a keg, whatever it is. So Koji is that person. It's like going to bring out because rice itself doesn't have the sugars that a grape does. Like when we pick it, it's going to convert the starches into sugars for okay. then the yeast to convert into the alcohol. And this is where the multiple parallel fermentation happens. So it's, it's quite, if, once you see it as a person, it becomes your yeah. friend and you it's can the, kind of see the process. It brings out the party inside you. Exactly. It brings the party <laughs> without Koji. Nothing happens. It's like ha having no Buddha in your life, right? <laughs> if you're a Buddhist <laughs> or a religious person. So basically, Koji interacts with all these other ingredients. It doesn't bring a lot of the output um, uh, generally in terms of flavor or what you taste in the glass. Unless you're using several. I mean, there's white Koji, yellow Koji, um, a couple different ones that are used. But basically, it's creating that starch, bringing it out. Let's go party bring the, the yeast together, go and, and convert it to alcohol. So if that makes sense. For, no, <laughs> so that's makes, the basic ingredients. Sense. That's, that's so incredible. We're talking about this King of Modern Light, which is a, a brewery that's in Niigata, started in the 1800s. Uh, and I'll tell you a little story. I don't know how much time we have. I, we didn't discuss this, but we, hopefully it doesn't yeah, turn dark I, on us. No, we have we have an hour max. Um, okay. But but yeah, let's let's dive into this because then we'll save it, uh, and it'll live forever. And fantastic. It, so. <laughs> awesome. So let's say um, where were we going? Um, King of Modern Light. King, so there's mm -hmm. this amazing fa uh, sake festival that happens. Unfortunately, not this year. I missed it, but it happens every year in Niigata. It's called Niigata Sake no Jin. It's the largest gathering of people going to taste sake. And here, almost 90 of, the, of all the producers of Niigata gather in this beautiful um, convention center uh, right by the Niigata River. And it gathers around 200, uh, 140 to 200,000 people um, on average every year. So it's a three-day thing, uh, two-day thing, sorry, Saturday and Sunday. And I went there for the first time three years ago and my head exploded. You go in and it's like the Olympics. You're in line. There's a thousand people waiting for the door to open at 930. And there's people stretching and drinking some power drinks and vitamins and water. And Get out you go here. in, <laughs> they give you your little <laughs> cup and your little choco, very traditional uh, at the entrance. And that's your tasting um, cup, right? So you go to the producers and they'll go and, and pour you their sakis. You go in, bam. So I was with a really good friend of mine who happens to know a lot of the producers. He's from Niigata. He's about 60 years old or so. And he's a label designer. So he has a lot of relationships with him. He's the one that really bugged me until I like to go. He picked me up in Tokyo and drove like a madman through the mountains to get back in time. So we're with him and he starts introducing me to the brewers. So a normal person would go and get a little, uh, I don't know, like five ounce taste in their little cup to taste it and then you taste the other sakes. But my friend uh, was saying, hey, he came all the way from California. He loves sake. So people were like overfilling my cup all the way to the rim and I would taste it. And then they would pull out the second bottle and say, okay, here's the other one and here's the other one. Now I quickly found out there's no spit cups or spittoons like we would in, <laughs> in a wine tasting, yeah. obviously. So um, an hour into the tasting, not even, <laughs> I'm a lightweight as you know. <laughs> I was pretty toasty. I ran to, I said, you got to excuse me. I'll be right back. I went and got a, a metal coffee uh, thing out of the machine. Uh -huh. I washed it and drank the coffee. And then I used that, like hiding it on my, my jacket to be spitting without being rude. So lesson learned. So anyway, we're going through the <laughs> tasting and I spot this label you have in your hand. And I look over, I do a double take. And I asked my friend, I said, hey, Kazuzan. What's that? He's like, oh, it's, it's called uh, Mineno Hakubai. They make this King of Modern Light. But yeah, uh, very, very small production. They don't want to really export. I said, I don't care. I'm going to go. Can you introduce me? So we go with the president, the main chacho, you call it, uh, 90, 80, 90 year old guy. He's there, very proud. And he's pouring his sakes. And we start talking. And I say, well, where do you export this? And he says, nowhere. Just here, uh, regional. And I say, well, the label, obviously, it says King of Modern Light in English. It's a beautiful, eye-catching design. 
And having tasted the, tasting the sake as we were speaking, I said, this is incredible. How could you not export? He's like, nope, we focus just in our backyard. We don't want to go anywhere. We're happy where we sell, blah, blah, blah. So I said, you got to contact like one of the people I know and, and let them export it. He says, no. Well, we close the story. I end up buying a bunch of bottles just to bring with me because I couldn't find it anywhere else around the area. And I bring in the backpack like I often do, like leave clothes in the hotel because I needed to bring more sake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And anyway, the second year I go back to the Nigat Sake Nogin, I have this sake in mind. I go straight, you line into their booth and I say, hey, I hope you remember me. I really hope you change your mind. So <laughs> there was a few other importers there at the time and I started introducing them to other people. And I tell people that I know, you got to convince this guy to bring it to the U.S. This has to be in the U.S. He says no again. So that was a pretty hard no. I gave him my card again. And a few months later, he emails and he says, you were so insistent and passionate. And truly, I'm scared about the export market. I don't know. I've never been to the U.S. And I don't know how you, the sake is going to get treated, respected, uh, poured and whatnot. So right. he says, but you're very insistent. So there's going to be a small allocation and just connect to the right people you want to import and we'll try it out. So finally, three years later, uh, as it, all the paperwork and everything, it yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. So super excited. This is one of my, my best buddies when it comes to having something always in the fridge. Crisp, elegant, to the point. I mean, I, I'm a big white wine drinker. I love yeah. uh, Bordeaux Blanc and, and Noir and uh, Gruner's, things like that. And this to me falls in the realm in there. So. Pretty, I, I'm interested to see what you, do you think after I tasting think it's it. I mean, I really think it's amazing. It it has all the things that you want from something like a like a clean Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, like it doesn't have the weight of a Viognier, like kind of, but it has a creaminess. It uh -huh. has like a, a a really beautiful viscosity, but it's light and it like picks back up. It's interesting. It's really dangerous because I'm looking at the back of this table <laughs> and it says it's 16 percent alcohol, which. It's, it is it's, 16 and on average for a white wine. Totally. So on average, and that's a great a question that comes up all the time. What's the alcohol in sake? So you'll mm -hmm. see a range from anywhere from 14 to 16. It's usually your, your, your medium. You will have some sakes that are all the way to 20, 22 called Genshu or undiluted. And then there's styles that are lower, uh, maybe like Riesling, 7%, a little sweeter in style and lower. Um, but basically that's, that's your commonplace, but also you don't drink a lot of it. I find myself where I would drink two glasses of a Gruner easily. This, I'm pretty happy with one, one and a half. Also, you usually get smaller pours at a restaurant, if you mm. will, but very um, dangerous. Yeah. The, so the back of this label, I think, is really interesting. It's also very insightful. And of the, of the labels, I mean, it's a beautiful front label, but the back label um, actually get, tells you a lot about this, um, this sake. Uh, the grade Jumai uh, Ginjo Sake, which is the grade of just just so I can recap what we just learned, right? So that's the uh, grade of milling. Um, exactly. But then it also says on there rate polishing ratio is sixty percent. So the, I mean, you've got the the label that says that it's going to be at this minimum, and then sixty percent is that what's left, or that's how much they take off? This is what they uh what's left. So they took what's off forty percent, and if you want to give it's called for... semi boy. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, the minimum would be 40% uh, taken away and you can go bigger. You can have in some styles 60% taken away and still call it a Junmai Ginjo just because they didn't want to compete with another brand they had or whatnot. Right. Um, and then you have a pre a Prefecture uh, Niigata, so that's where it's coming from. Exactly. And then the rice, uh, Saki Komachi, which I think you mentioned before, so that's the actual grain of rice. What is SMV plus one? So that's a great question because this will help you when you're uh, at, at a store and some mm -hmm. restaurants still uh, put it on print. SMB mm -hmm. is a sake meter value and basically okay. it's telling you how sweet or dry the sake is. Oh, and an easy okay. way to remember is um, higher is drier and is usually drier. you'll see it. Yeah, easy, okay. right? Higher is drier. If you see a minus, it's going to be sweet. It's going to have some sort of like uh, spat lese or truck and burn lese kind of quality okay. to it. But if you see a 10, you're, you're going to be pretty happy. And this is, uh, although it's a one, it drinks very uh, dry because of the acidity that's spiking out of the, the amino acids produced mm. by this style and the rice itself. This is so interesting. I, I am blown away by how much information I have gained in the last 17 seconds that we've been on the chat. 
because uh, that's what it feels like. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we are with Eduardo Dinkler, the sake drinker, uh, talking about all things sake. And uh, if you've ever been curious on anything about sake or you're just trying to expand your wine knowledge, this is a really good place to start. And as I mentioned before we got started, I know this much. Now I know this much about <laughs> sake. And we're going to continue down this rabbit hole of learning a little bit more about this. He's breaking down labels and, and styles and things like that. This is absolutely beautiful. I could sit and drink this forever. I saw my mom is on here. She would love this. Awesome. This is like, this is right. Around. This is very, very dangerous. Um, so temperature wise, where, where should you be temperature wise? Cause I've, I remember going to like Japanese restaurants uh, or, or like, you know, garbage sushi restaurants and they would have hot and cold. I've heard hot is like a no, no. Uh, so basically that that's a loaded question because it has a lot of answers. So hot sake usually, well, let me backtrack. When you go, for instance, and buy a bottle of $3, a $3 bottle of Pinot Grigio at Trader Joe's, what do mm -hmm. you do, right? As a, as a wine drinker, you put it in the freezer. Get it ice cold. Get it super cold and it's going to taste great. Right, it's gonna hide any faults it has, if any, and it's gonna be easy drinking. So with sake, it's the opposite. So when you have an, a sake with impurities, lower quality, which not all hot sake is low quality, but if you have some like that with some volatile aromas and stuff, you warm it up and it takes away some of that and it makes it drinkable mm. and very nice. So a lot of the mom and pop's restaurants will buy the box and heat it up and have the machine and it's a happy place. That's how I started drinking uh, sake. That's what really drew me in and drinking. And it was like a beautiful kind of fun kind of buzz with friends. We started doing it weekly for a while. It was a place here down uh, in Napa called Sushi Mambo that has moved since now to Calistoga. But anyway, we started drinking it like that. And that's what got me into it. So sake, uh, hot sake has a lot of historical value. So in the early days, it used to be a cure uh, to bring samurais back to life after a battle. Also, when you're sick, you would drink hot sake or in winter, it's a hard, heartwarming thing. Mm -hmm. So some styles these days are made deliberately in an artisan or rustic way where you heat it up and it, it brings a lot of richer texture. And it's amazing with like a, a winter dish like butternut squash or even a hamburger, little things like that. And that's one of the things about sake that when you're, you're playing on a Junmai Honjoso level, you have multiple um, dimensions to play with. So one of my favorite things to do, uh, and even at Morimoto when I was there or at home these days, I'll grab one sake. I have to be careful not, not to be super premium because you don't want to destroy it. By heating it up, you take away some of the beauty sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. But when it's a rustic style, you put hot sake, warm and cold. And you grab three dishes. Like you can have a salmon riette from Bouchon. You can have oh, like uh, the strips of bacon from Press, which I know you know. And you can have uh, an amazing like oyster. And you can have all three with the three different temperatures and be an amazing pair with one sake. So it's pretty unique to the, to the world of sake. Oh, that's so, super cool. Yeah. It, I don't to, know any other beverages. Well, I guess like tea you could do that with. But I don't tea, really know. Tea, brandy, like some beverages, people do it. You could have it like multiple different that's so interesting and have and do it well exactly and to me like my favorite practice to do is for instance this this the sake we're drinking right now mm -hmm. i put it in the fridge overnight right ideally mm -hmm. or if you don't have if you use butter you put it in the freezer because you can't you can't wait to open it and then you drink it you try it super cold let it open up and then as you're having a meal or hanging out with friends or on a skype call or zoom or whatever it is you start letting it develop and open up and warm. And once it starts getting like room temperature, it brings you a whole other experience. Like mm -hmm. now I'm getting more of a mango and I'm mm -hmm. getting a little, even though it's still very dry, but the texture is kind of opening up. It's uh, getting a little more sumo wrestler on us. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was one of my questions. So, I mean, obviously you put it in the fridge closed, but once, now that this is open, um, it, does it have the same shelf life as a wine in how long it can be open? No, How and that's another say? thing that I love about sake. So sake is very forgiven. Now, there's a couple things, right? Uh, and this is just my own thinking. Uh, there's an amazing friend of mine, Jesse Pugascu, I think is, is watching. Uh, big shout out to him. He, I was doing this sake show and I, was, I had him as a guest once. And he told me he has bottles of sake in his fridge that he's had for months. So I started doing this. I was very curious. So basically, I would ask, open a bottle of sake put a date in the back, have a glass or two, 
and then three, six, nine months later. So later on, Laura and I started a tradition at home where we'll, as soon as fall starts hitting and it starts getting cold, mm-hmm. she'll get like a, a leg of lamb and then put it in the, in the crock pot with a lot of vegetables mm-hmm. and we'll dig in the fridge. Sometimes there's not a lot of room because of the sake. We have three fridges, uh, actually five. Two are dedicated to wine. Uh, <laughs> one, one, half of it to food and the rest to sake. So that gives you an idea. I'll give you a tour next time. Yeah. But anyway, so we'll dig in and grab the oldest bottle that we have out there, ideally of rustic style. And what happens to sake with age, open after open oxidative, uh-huh. it, it's like it went to the gym. It starts getting this muscle richness, like really rip and aromas. So in that case, it can really pair with a big dish. So you have like a beef bourguignon or you have a, a, a bacon cheeseburger, like with all the helpings and bone marrow and blah, blah, blah. So the, in that case, it's going to really stand up to it. Because when you think about sake pairings, and generally, some of the sakes tend to be very soft, delicate, and you, unlike wine, you suffer over running, running over the sake mm. rather than the wine with tannins or acid taking over the food. So it's kind mm-hmm. of a... You kind of, you're putting this sack and you're saying, you go to the gym. It's like you go to prison and work out. And <laughs> once you get really buffed and rich, you're going to be ready to tackle this lamb, like a lamb that's been in the, in the crock pot for 14 hours. And it's going to be an amazing experience. Wow. So very forgiven. Now, let me get back to a little bit because the uh, life, the shelf life of sake as directed by a brewer, it's about six months to a year. Ideally, okay. right? This is like what, what, what you hear from them. Having never been opened or after it's opened? Um, having never been opened, ideally. Okay. If it's like a Nama or unpasteurized style, especially, right? Okay. So you have this range. However, as it develops, it, it doesn't spoil. It, it turns into a little more richer oxidative without being like sherry and things like that. But mm-hmm. even after opening, it just breathes and it's beautiful. The things that it's talking to you, it's like, oh, what are you saying? <laughs> it's like speaking different languages and it's, it's amazing. But yeah, uh, the shelf life, one, one's open, you can go for a while, and H sake is incredible. Let me get into two things about H sake. So one of them is regular sake that you've aged in your garage. And there's people like Bo Temkin from True Sake that has said, oh my God, I had this sake for 10 years and didn't mean to age it, but just found it, and it's amazing. And the other thing is koshu. So the word koshu, and you don't have to take notes, but if you want to. So it means basically three things in, in Japanese. Koshu is the grape, a white wine grape that Buddha gave to the Japanese a thousand years ago. And it makes amazing white wines. If you come across Koshu from Japan, incredible. The second one means old, which kind of ties up to Koshu sake, which means by law has to be aged three years. And normally it's going to be an inert vessel like porcelain or stainless steel, where it's mm-hmm. not bringing like wine, a lot of aromas, a lot of crazy brewers playing with wood and barrels and stuff. But basically, H, uh, koshu sake is going to bring you those sherry uh, aromas, kind of richness, beautiful uh, different layerings that is going to pair amazing with like, uh, uh, like prosciutto or uh, mm. jamon or cheeses and things like that. So a sake is never, a sake doesn't ever see oak. It never really sees a vessel unless it's intended to be aged. Rarely. Um, There is a producer, Aramasa, which is one of the cold producers in Japan. um, I was there, I think it was about a year and a half ago at a restaurant that is amazing. And um, it was, they're known, it's called Genbai Moto. And when you go to Japan, hopefully we work, go together. But if not, I'm going to make sure you go. And visit and they they're crazy with pairings with like this crazy out of the out of the box dishes and sakes and they poured me an aramasa that it was aged uh, for a small amount of time in the california chardonnay barrels and oh. it's a geeky fun experience but definitely comes through it added a lot of richness a lot of things so it, it's fun it happens but it's definitely not a common thing yeah this is um, $35. Uh, it's available on the Wine Axis. There's a whole sake section on the Wine Axis website, which is very cool. And it's entirely curated by you, I'm sure. Um, but but uh, $35, somebody had asked what a, what a good price is, what an average price is for a sake of this quality. Is 35 kind of in that spectrum? Is a little low? It's a little high? You know, I think Evans uh, mentioned earlier, uh, who's joined us as well, 20 to 40. It's, it's an mm-hmm. amazing range. Obviously, you'll have some. We have an amazing uh, offer coming out in a few weeks 
uh, of one of my all-time favorites. This mm. is uh, Divine Droplets. It's a Shizuku style uh, method, which means basically they grab the mash of the, of the sake and put a drip method. They hang it like a tea bag and just let it drip. So by doing all that, you create no pressure. It creates a very elegant style. This is a Jumai Daiginjo. We can talk about it another time or, or later. But basically, yeah. we'll have, we'll uh, that's going to be 70 uh, it's amazing. It's seventy dollars and it's a steal. It usually goes for way more. Uh, the French Laundry has poured it. Uh, Sir Lucero, who's one of my mentors and great friend, uh, has been in love with this sake for forever, and a lot of people I know. So there's definitely different price ranges. I mean, you'll find sakes at two thousand dollars in restaurants and uh, retail applications. But going back to the question, twenty to forty, you're a very happy place to start. Watch for the styles you'll find on the lower end, not because they're, they're better or worse, mm -hmm. but because if you think about it on the triangle we were talking about, on the lower range, you have a, a more rustic, richer style with less polishing and it's going to be a little more aggressive in a way. So if you like Syrahs, like Northern Rose Syrah or any Rhone and, and richer things like that, better, a little yeah, gaming. Yeah. So yes, you will really enjoy those uh, the bottom part of the triangle because it's more generous, more given. But if you like more softer, more elegant stuff that you, what you kind of associate with sake, it's going to be higher on the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So that's going to hit you 30 to $40 price range. Okay. And then you have to take into consideration the, the strain of rice. Yes. Uh, if you get geeky enough and if the producer uh, listed in there, then yes, the strain of rice, Yamada Nishiki, it's one of the father rices, uh, really elegant, focused, linear. Also, um, uh, Dewa Sansan from Yamagata, Omachi, one of my favorites. I mean, there's, there's some Omachi uh, rice, uh, sakes produced that remind me of Zanser, where they have like this tension and richness and you can cut through them. So there's different, there's Gohyaku Mangoku, guys, gives a little more richness, more Chardonnay-like in the, in the palate. Oh, like, cool. Yeah, so there's, there's things, but also the methods, uh, kind of affect a lot on that end. Right. But uh, why don't we talk lots, about the lots next Lots of variables one. just like wine, huh? Oh, yeah. It, it's <laughs> one of those. There's, there's no absolutes. It's, yeah. it's just suggestions and generalities. But so next, we're going to go to Takechiyo. And uh, Takechiyo is uh, a very, uh, it's a madman in terms of sake production. Basically, and this one I came across also with, uh, during the, the Niigata Sake no Jin. So, just like uh, the King of Modern Lights, I'm walking around with my friend Kazu and we're talking about things. And I look over and one of the booths, I mean, you're talking about, there was like 80,000 people this day in this thing. And it's like schools of fish. Everybody's so organized in Japan and people <laughs> drink, 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 drink. And then when they drink a little too much, they go and sit down on the side and take a nap. And then they get up and keep drinking. And then they buy a bottle because you can buy it from the producers. We need grab a little all of food. this here. Oh, I, I know. It's, <laughs> it's unlike anything else. And then you keep drinking and everything. But everybody's very, like, there's no unruly people. Nobody's getting yeah. drunk just to They're get drunk. Civilized. They're tasting, right? It's amazing. It. So as we're walking through the tasting and I see this booth and a big thing in Japan in sake in general, it's actually on the decline as far as consumption. And um, as far as the charts say, the younger generations have other, just like here, like wine. I don't know if you saw that the um, article in the New York Times about um, Andy Beckstoffer and yeah. all that. He's talking about millennials. So in Japan, millennium, something, he said. millennium, the millennium <laughs> with the wine. So very similar, but more drastic even in Japan, where the young generations are opting for other beverages or not drinking. So the industry is suffering and it's going kind of like this, gradually low and you need ways to keep them engaged and entertained. Luckily for sake, we have the US, uh, the UK, Australia, kind of leading the way into, in consumption and, and drinking a lot of sake, bringing it up, right, on the rice. But, so I'm looking through this uh, tasting and I see a booth with a line just going all around. And some booths <laughs> had nobody there or had one person or two, right? There's 90 booths, pretty much. Yeah. So this guy had a line around of all young people. You're talking about 20 to 30 tops and there were like all these cool hipsters and the guy that's pouring the sake i don't know uh he could be a great friend of carlo mondali whom i love and is a great friend but he had this kind of like a, a goatee a ponytail 
and it ha he had a vest and, and this crazy looking glasses and he's pouring the sake and everybody's just all oh, like googly eyes around him and stuff. So I asked Kazus, like, tell me about these guys. He's like, oh, they're just crazy. They're doing things that nobody else is doing. And they're kind of just trying to change the world and get more people to drink sake. And they're doing it obviously successfully. Mm -hmm. So I finally, we cut through the crowds and Kazu knows the guy, of course. And he says, hey, uh, blah, blah, blah. He's like, come here, come here, come here. And the guy's like, I'm busy, I'm busy, Kazu. And he's like, no, 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 come here. He finally bugs him so much that he comes out and he, in, he introduces me to him. He's like, oh, this is Eduardo, blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, great to meet you. He, he spoke some English. We started talking briefly because he had like literally a train down, right? People wanted to taste it and buy the sakis. So we start talking briefly and he says, basically I do this different chapters and each chapter, it represents a rice strain. Everything else is done the same way. So this is the Takachio 59 series as, yeah, exactly. 59 mm -hmm. refers to the polishing of the rice, right? Okay. So just about Junma Ginjo, it's all vintage. And every, uh, oh, every yeah, season, they, uh, which is not very common to have a vintage in sake. It's kind of a, mm. a newer thing. But every season, they focus in a rice strain, uh, a, diff um, a set of rice strains, which they call chapters. So this one, the chapter six, is Miyama Nishiki rice. Um, Miyama Nishiki is a rice strain from Nagano normally. And it's beautifully aromatic, uh, elegant, grown in small uh, quantities uh, in the mountains of Nagano, which is wine country as well. And anyway, each chapter is done the same way. Junma Ginjo, unpasteurized, polished exactly the same way, same yeast strain, and the only difference is the rice. And he says, this is going to change your mind. So he starts pouring me like a couple real quick as he's like trying to speed up the process. And my head just exploded. We tasted um, uh, number one, uh, number three, which is uh, Iponjime, and then, uh, what was it, uh, Omachi, I believe, and then the Miyama Nishiki, and bam, completely different. And I said, you got to be kidding me. There's no way you made this the same way. It's like, yep, you can come visit me uh, another time, and we can talk about it. It's like, okay, let me buy a few of them. So in that same trip, I go back to Tokyo. I spend a couple nights. I, I always try to, to at least see it the scene and breathe because I feel like at home in Japan and I go <laughs> into a couple sake bars and um, I start asking about Takachio and these people start looking at me like I'm crazy they're like Takachio no out this is a no and I said no I, I just want to taste some Takachio I see a little sign over there that says Takachio is like so they bring this guy that spoke a little and he's like it's only for locals and I say <laughs> why is it only for locals he's like just very, very small me, Choto. And I said, no, you got it, you get, please. I'm a local, what are you saying? Exactly, I'm like, look at me. <laughs> so I, I started talking and I started explaining, I give him my card, I, 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 unfortunately I had to resource to give him my card. I don't like to, oh, I, I like sake. I love sake, but I don't want to brag about it to somebody sure, there. Sure, sure. But the guy finally, after a long conversation and me buying a couple of other sakes, he pulls out the bottle and he says, okay, they only release so much and in, in so small amounts that we keep it to the people that support us all the time and live here. And finally, they let me do it. And now I'm great friends with them. And I go there all the time. But that was like super crazy. And tasting them, uh, this is like, as I mentioned earlier, a sake on steroids. It's got so much given you on the nose, on the palate. It's like, to me, it's like farmer's market blueberries and a, little, a lot of Ooh. minerality, a lot of richness. Yeah. This is your best friend with like Thai food or Indian. Go really yeah. high on the spice, the heat. And this is amazing. I mean, let me taste is, it again. Is there a little, um, it feels, it, to me, this, this actually reminds me of a, a Riesling. And I hate, I uh -huh. hate using the wine equivalents, but I think that's the way that I am going to wrap my, my head around it. But it feels like maybe, is there a, a slight amount of residual sugar? There's a little bit of res residual sugar by design, which I, com in my head, tie around having the youth and the younger guys had going for it. It's like, oh, because yeah. usually younger guys are developing their palate in a way and likes those things, right? There's a little bit of mm -hmm. fruit. There's the, the sweetness, but the acid, just like you mentioned, the Riesling, it kind of cuts through a spine and yeah. cleans it really well. And it ends on a, a very bright, it's like licking a battery kind of note. Yeah. That we, we talked about a reference yes. before, but this is the <laughs> ultimate licking a battery if you yeah. haven't done it recently. And I have not done it recently. <laughs> I'll send you some batteries on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> but basically, it's so 
jolty and, and big energy and, and beautiful. And um, it comes in a 500 ml, which I'm thankful. Otherwise, it would be too much. And this yeah. is also 16%. And uh, it, it's fun. And each chapter brings you a little something else. Like the Omachi has a little more of fresh cut Meyer lemon and Buddha's hand citrus. Uh, the Eponjim is very herbal and green. But it's to me crazy that it's just a rice strain that's making a difference. It, it's nuts. You know, what's interesting is I first tasted this and I was like, mm, I think I like the other one better. Now, I really like this. This, like, it didn't, the first sip, I was like, this is good. It's like, it almost, that light, that, that battery looking, it almost had like a phenolic uh, component uh -huh. to it. It was just like a little bit, uh, like, fin, like a, like the skin of a pear, where it's just like a little totally. bit. Totally. In the middle of the tongue in the back, yeah. and it sits there. And then, and like, I can see a tiny bit of um, what looks like maybe carbonation. Is is it just, uh, like, residual oh, yeah. CO2 that's left it's, in there? To it's get unpasteurized, a little and they keep uh -huh. a little bit of, of carbonation. They do have another line in which they actually carbonate it, and, it has, and it's a little cloudier. And it's, like, it's the craziest thing right now in Japan. Like, if you go in, in Instagram on the locals around Tokyo area and stuff, you'll see it a lot. And it's called origami style. And you start opening very small because it kind of explodes on you. But uh -huh. this is kind of like the tame version of it, but really full. It's like a bull in a china shop kind of quality to it and really rambocious and mouth watering. I mean, in a lot of ways, it just oh, keeps going watering. and going and going. This is um, so, so tasty. I, I love it. So you, I, I'm pretty sure like a lot of people, myself included, before I tasted it, I've never had anything like this. Mm -hmm. It is so different. So, so uh, captivating. Mm -hmm. um, so, Following the story, I go back and I start talking to Casper. I said, you got to connect those guys and let them kind of export a little bit. He says, they refuse. They only make so much. They, I, as, and I had told him a story about Tokyo. He says, as you found out, they're even so small in, in, in Japan proper that they run out all the time. And they want to keep it like that. They don't want to make more. So basically, uh, after talking to him, we established communication. I went back the second year. And this was, the guy was more like it. He's like, you guys look like you're, you know what you're talking about. We would love to explore other markets and we'll take a little bit of, of the production and send it. So they're bringing like some ridiculous, like 15 cases of each chapter into the US. That's it. It comes to California and that's it. We managed to, to lock in an amount for, for wine axes. Yeah. And I mean, as you see them, and if you have been on the wine axes sake uh, page for a few months, you've seen we've rotated through chapters because they keep running out. And it's oh. only a handful of places uh, that I can think uh, that carry it. Um, Single Thread has been a huge fan. Yeah. Uh, the French Laundry carries the Omachi. Um, uh, Niku Steakhouse uh, and Omakase in San Francisco. And a couple little places like that. But it's basically just a handful of, of chapters and, and, uh, and uh, seasonality that comes out every year. Yeah. How um, – and this is, this is 35 as well. I think they're both uh... – 35 which is just a steal i think you know to get um any wine of this quality for 35 dollars would be oh uh, it's unheard just of just ridiculous but i mean the fact that one i mean if i think if you're someone who wants to experiment the fact that you can definitely leave this in your fridge you can play with it for a little while uh you don't need a lot of it um just an, an amazing way to like get your feet wet and obviously you've cultivated what is what exists on white access so we know that you've done your work in uh in is it nigata uh yes i, I mean I, I do gotta say nigata yeah the yeah. the sake world is is a team it's a family it's it's really close um not that the wine world is not but it's amazing it's a family of what uh everybody's doing like uh jesse evans um all these people that are um, working in synergy to promote sake and, and bring it to more people and have it uh, be at your house. And it's just not only a, a sushi night kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's amazing from the producers all the way to the people out here, like Monica Samuels out in New York, who I have to introduce you and you got to do a, a live stream with her. But all these people, uh, Stuart Morris at Pabu in San Francisco, it just, everybody works towards the same goal and supports each other. And it's amazing. And this sake is, uh, kind of serve a purpose uh, because of exclusivity and, and style, but mm -hmm. also open stores for people to try it and say, wow, I never thought sake could do that. And now I'm going to be hooked and try even more things. So um, what, what do you think it is uh, that has prevented people from drinking sake in the past? Is there a stigma that you think is frequently associated with it? 
There is. Uh, there's something that um, almost like kind of what Sher- happens to sherry, right? Mm. It's, it's a little harder to understand. Uh, happened to German wine uh, mm-hmm. forever, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy to look at a label and say, oh, my God, I, well, I don't read Japanese. I don't know what these guys are doing. <laughs> I don't want to gamble my money, whether it's $20 or 100 and not know what I'm going to get and have to dump it down the drain. So very um, um, kind of a closed door behind it, a lot of mysticism and a lot of um, kind of a, an exotic kind of component to it, which now it's helping more people drink sake. But back then it was like, I don't understand how it's made. I don't understand... And this is another thing. The first excursion of people, a lot of people, uh, into the sake world was sake bombs. And just like peppermint schnapps happens to a lot of people, like you drink when you're young and you think, oh, this is the coolest thing. And then the next day you can't stand the hangover because you didn't do it wisely. You missed it. (laughs) You you went crazy. So people say, oh, no, I cannot drink sake. Happens to me on a daily basis when I I, I try to educate or talk to somebody or share with friends. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's not that kind of night. We're like, what are you talking about? Sake is, is it's a, similar to, to wine and alcohol, and it's a very refined, beautiful beverage. We're not doing shots of this, and we're not trying to get blotto. This is like <laughs> a very uh, educational, kind of elegant experience. So uh, that's one of the things that kind of put a, a curtain behind it. And luckily now, people are experimenting with different cuisine, uh, barbecue and sake. Are you kidding me? It's like, oh where God, were you on my so life? Good. Yeah, yes. it's, it's incredible. Steak, uh, there's some fantastic sakas that do amazing with the, the richness, the proteins of the steak. Um, so there's no ending. And, and it's amazing to see more and more people stuck in their fridges at home with, with some sake. And now that they're, they're not scared of how do I drink it? Do I need the proper glassware as we talked about? It's like right. a wine glass. It's like um, heating it up or not. All these little things, as you start uncovering those layers, it makes it friendly and really fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you're, you're super friendly and fun. That, that definitely helps to, for all oh, of us who, who don't understand it, you got either way is, is very helpful. I, I, somebody commented before that they, I think it was like Rock and Cap, that we've just learned so much. I have learned a tremendous amount. I love surrounding myself with people like you who just know so much more than me because I, I feel oh, like I just grab. We all start somewhere <laughs> and I, I don't know much. I just like to share what I know. That's, yeah. that's it. Um, well, th- these are such a treat. Now you have me very, very hungry for spicy Thai food, which I can't get any of up here in St. Helena. So, uh, oh my God, is there, you is need there to make a trek. In Napa that you, that there's a like? couple places in Napa. Uh, there's the one on, uh, it's a tiny little place on, uh, on Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called, uh, I'm going to be racist and say it's called Siam House, although a lot of them are called that. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I think yeah. that's, okay. that's the one. Okay. Outstanding. But yeah, it's oh, good. Okay. Yeah. If not, make the trek and get some Vietnamese food at like Pho Number One or something like that. And yeah, yeah. No, I got it. I got to get down there. Uh, totally. And yes, of course, M- Mimi Nashi. They, they, oh, Mimi Nashi is outstanding. They don't do Thai food. They do uh, yeah. Japanese, but um, but I'll, but they do I'll some great it. interpretations. We've they done do. it a couple of times. Yeah. Every Friday they're doing it. Yeah, I saw that they've wow. got their uh, that those the ch- I like the the chicken skin, the chicken tail. That's my yes. My jam. Totally. Um, mango yeah, and nice mango and main. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's. I don't know if you're familiar with Ramen Gaijin over in Sebastopol, mm-hmm. but they're about to I'm open a I'm a huge fan place. of those guys. They're about to open a Thai place. No way. In, in Windsor. Oh, yes. I think it's called wow. uh, Kom, Kom, Lai, Kom Lai, I think. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, they just announced that it should be opening like within like a month or two. That's so incredible. Because you know what? Ramen Gaijin is one of those places when I'm so homesick about Tokyo and just a random ramen spot. They it's nailed so good, it. right? It's oh my so god! Good. Yeah. I I have had I've had ramen in SF, LA, New York. There is nowhere like Robin Gaijin. Those guys are yeah. amazing. Totally. And I'm, yeah, there's I'm like so different levels. I'd say they are a different, uh, definitely like homesick kind of place, like very traditional. Yeah. Mimi Nashi does an amazing interpretation of like modern things in it. Um, but uh, it's it's just depending what you like. You've got a you've got a fan of, of Takachio uh, in NYC. Who's in, is anybody importing into NYC? Oh, the Saka Ninja. Uh, yeah. Not that I know. I think it's it's so small that it's only coming to California. But uh, Chris, I'll send you a, a note and we can connect and I'll try to connect you to to uh, whoever we know and uh, it, try to make it, it happen. Is it line access shipping to uh, to New York or no? Did you guys? They stop? do ship to New York. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know state to state it can vary. 
Um, well, Eduardo, I cannot thank you enough for all of the information you shared today. I know you've got like a 10 part series on uh, Psalm TV. Oh right? yeah, feel free uh, to check so it out. If you need something to go to sleep at night, just turn oh, it on and it. <laughs> <laughs> grab the um, white sake or not, no, or just some wine. You're, and... you're great. I've watched, I watched a few episodes um, uh, just before this so I can make sure that I wasn't <laughs> talking out of my ass. Uh, but, but yeah, there's a 10 part series on Psalm TV. And I was just telling a friend about Psalm TV the other day. It's amazing to me that a lot of you don't know that it exists. Um, it's so amazing. Those, it is amazing. And for those who have seen the Psalm movies, the, the, the three documentaries, uh, and now of course, Delicacy just came out, um, which is Jason Wise's newest documentary. And Psalm 4 uh, is coming, which I'm Psalm just like, so coming. ready to watch. Yes, the nerds are excited. We're getting And you have an um, amazing blind taste in there with Vanessa. I mean, yes. there's a series. I, yes. I, I can spend days just watching that. So it's, it's a pretty so fun outlet. Much good, so, so, so much good content. And it's uh, like 10 bucks a month. And uh, it's an app just like, you know, Netflix or whatever. Um, and it's all like wine and sake and beverage related content and hospitality content. Uh, of most of it's original, a few streaming things and food stuff on there. Um, and just really a wonderful place. And, and a 10 part series with Eduardo, if you want to deep dive a little bit more on sake. And like we said, uh, both of these sakes are available on Wine Access. I'll be sure to link them so you guys can find them. Um, and buy more sake. Let's bring more of this good stuff. Oh my God. So we all need to Eduardo just to collectively he, get yes. more sake. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, there's not yeah. a bad sake. It's like some people say, I don't like Chardonnay. It's like, no, you haven't had the right Chardonnay, right? Yes. It's yes. sake. It's like those people that just put a block on it. It's like, I don't like sake. It's like, no, keep trying. <laughs> keep trying. We'll I'll send you, you some. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't matter, but it's, it's yeah. amazing. So cheers to you. Thank cheers you so much. Any time to Thank talk about you. sake and wine or everything. So cheers. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. This has been very eye-opening and equally delicious, if not more. So I appreciate Crystal, it. Crystal, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> Just driving here. <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. Cheers. Thank you, Bye, Amanda. Thank talk you, to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh my gosh, how great is he? I just love him so much. Um, he's just wonderful. Uh, his background, so you, so if you're unfamiliar with Eduardo, uh, he was the former beverage director at Morimoto uh, for the Global Morimoto and um, works for Wine Access now as uh, on the wine team and lives here in Napa Valley. We just love him so much. Um, but he has been into sake for some time now. He travels to Japan very extensively and frequently. So uh just amazing to have him on here talking about something he's clearly so passionate about. I hope you guys enjoy that as much as I did. I love learning from people that know more than me. There's a lot of them out there uh, and a lot of people, a lot of people know more than I do. Uh, so it's great to hear from them and, and use their knowledge and gain a little something from it. So I'll see you all soon. Thank you for tuning in. And again, uh, all of these hockey is available on wine access. So uh, be sure to check them out. 35 bucks, what a steal. You can keep it in your fridge and have something delicious all the time, as long as you don't drink it all in one night. Um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.